All right, let's get started. So we're going to start with uh, chapter eight, uh, government loans. All right, so we looked at the different types of programs, uh, but tonight what we're end up ending up going to do is we're going to talk about the governmental loans. Now, I can tell you on average, most of the time, the governmental loans are going to probably be about 70 to 80% of your business. Uh, reason why, most people that are purchasing a home is going to primarily be more focused on uh, the individuals that are, uh, what's the word, they're, they're first time home buyers. Okay, so with them being first time home buyers in this particular situation, uh, they are, like I said, they're not going to most likely meet the standards of a conventional loan. Okay, so remember, conventional loans are going to be loans that are going to end up basically being uh, the bank giving the money to you. Okay, versus with the governmental loans, these are ending up, they're going to be FHA, uh, VA, USDA, things to that nature. Okay. So we're going to go through these different types, but also the reason that this is one of the number one uh, loans that everybody loves is the fact that they enjoy this uh, because of the fact of the matter is they actually put low down payments. Okay, so your down payment is a lot lower. So when a person comes in, I always get this every time, even when I'm teaching these courses at uh, my other college that I work at, uh, one of the things everybody, when I poll my class, first time, I'll go in and I'll say, what do y'all think that it costs to uh, buy a house? How much do you got to put down? And on average, everybody says 20%. You got to put 20% down. Or they'll say, you know, uh, 50%. You know, they think they throw out these wild numbers because they think that I can't buy a house because the fact is, is that it's like 300000 Thus, I've got to put down like $50,000. Okay. And that's not always the case. Okay? And it's not always going to be the case. So what happens in this particular situation is, is that with governmental loans, they only have to put three and a half percent down. Now, if they're a veteran, how much do you think they got to put down? Zero. Zero dollars. Zero dollars. What about USDA? Certain USDAs, Travis, how much do they got to put down? Zero. Zero still. So in that situation, if you're in a certain approved USDA area, like here in College Station, uh, if you're going into like the South College Station between uh, Welburn and Navasota, some of that land is USDA approved land and you only have to pay zero dollars to move in or they're as low as $500. So you go in, either of y'all or anybody in here goes and finds a client and they want to buy a house and you tell them, hey, you can move into this house for $500, they're gonna buy, okay? So little things like this helps them. So the government does provide different initiatives to help individuals to end up to purchase a house uh, at relatively good prices. Now, should you as a real estate agent say that, Travis, I'm a client, I'm looking to buy, would it be wise, Travis, for you to end up, if you look at my bank account and I have $500 in my account, and I'm like, I'm gonna go buy a house. Would it be a wise idea to put me into a house if I got 500 bucks? No, not at all. Not in any shape or form. So, just because a client may have $500, remember, like we talked yesterday, there are certain percentages that they have to have in regards to income, debt to income, and things like that matter. So, again, these are very important situations. So, what we're going to start off with is the most important and the largest okay, that everybody goes into at least, and that's the FHA. Uh, you will hear this a bazillion times in your uh, in your career. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, FHA basically, and we'll hit these real quick, and we'll come back to them. FHA is basically a program under the mortgage insurance, and it's directed by HUD. Okay, and again, it insures loans that are made by local lenders. So, like I tell people this all the time, if you end up, say for example, that Mr. Keith say that he ends up, he is a, um, a lender, okay? Mr. Keith is a lender and he has $10 billion, okay, to his bank's name. Do you think, guys and gals, that Mr. Keith is gonna wanna lend that money to at-risk people? Why not? Because they don't have a high chance of paying it back. They don't have a high chance of paying it back. It's very low, okay? 
So in that situation is he doesn't want to take a chance of putting his money at risk. Okay. So in these particular situations is we want to make certain that we have to incentivize Mr. Keith. So to incentivize Mr. Keith, what would be a good way of doing it? Well, one of the best ways is what number two says. It ensures the loans. So say, for example, that Mr. Travis, you're the United States government, and you walk up to Mr. Keith and you say, Mr. Keith, I got a deal for you, sir. I'm gonna go over here, sir, and I'm gonna end up, I'm going to go in, and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to ensure that if Mr. Aiden does not pay you back, I'll pay you the remainder. Whatever's left, take care of it. Do you think Mr. Keith is going to be more likely to now lend that money to Aiden? Oh, yeah. Of course, because does he have any, any risk in it? No, very little. Okay. So in that situation is in an FHA loan, there is very, very little risk for Keith. Okay. So that's what happened is back in the day when the economy was tanking, what ended up happening was lenders just said, hoard my money, I'll hoard my money, okay? I'm gonna keep it all to myself. Well, if you hoard your money, how is the economy gonna be stimulated if Aiden or Travis or Stampin' or myself can't buy a house? It's not, okay? That's where you run into the rich get richer because they're hoarding all the cash. And guess what? The economy eventually, like I tell people this all the time is, you know, people wanna get as much money as they can. But here's the thing is it's just like back in the 1930s. If you go into a depression, that dollar can be worth what? If, no, if all the money's held by, say, a very few people, what's the majority gonna do then? They're just gonna create a new, new type of money. That's why Bitcoin came out, okay? Because the rich had all the dollars, so they said, well, let's just start a brand new thing. Let's just start from scratch. So what happens here is, is this incentivizes people to do what? to go over into these situations and to buy, okay, and to lend, okay? Now, the requirements, however, is number one, the application. We've got to make certain that the application process is done correctly, okay? We've got to review that application with a fine tooth comb, okay? Unfortunately, people like Aiden here lie a lot. Come on, Aiden. So on his application, he may put down that I make $15,000 a month. Right now as a college student. Okay. And, and you ask him, where does he work at? Myself. I work for myself. I make $15,000 a month. Dang, what do you do, Aiden? None of your business. Okay. In that situation is you are going to end up, they have to review those applications very strictly. Okay. We got to make certain that you have proof. Mr. Grossman and I are currently working on an applicant for a person on a lease, and the individual put down that he's making X amount of dollars a year. Well, okay, that's wonderful. That's your word. Now I need proof. So I had to have him send me proof that what he said actually was what it was. Well, he did send me proof. Well, the next thing is, is okay, I've got that checked off, but now I need to see how you were in regards to residing. Were you a good tenant? Okay, did you take care? Did you pay your bills? All those things. That's where it draws into a bad situation. Because when a person has a self income employment, it's very difficult to justify how much money they're making. And again, does it mean that everybody's like that? No. Normally with self employed people, why do you think most people are self employed? What do you think the reason is, Travis? Why do most people prefer self employment over a W 2? Time freedom. Freedom? But also, what can you do with, with it on taxes? You can oh. do, it starts with a D word. You remember what it's called? You can take deductions. Yeah, I was going to say write-offs. That's oh, the yeah, same yeah, thing, exactly. yeah. same thing. Deductions are write-offs. And so what happens is, is if Mr. Travis, you worked a job, a W-2, and you made $100,000 a year, you're going to have to pay taxes to the government, okay? But if you're a real estate agent and you make $100,000, how much you got to pay to the government? Depends, right? You may end up, say, at W-2, say you may have to pay $20,000 in, okay? But over as a 1099, a real estate agent, you have expenses. You are your business. So if you're your business, you might have spent 
thirty thousand dollars in repair or in, in uh, advertising costs and all this other stuff. So you may not have to pay a dime into the government. Okay. But here's the key thing here. This is what I try to tell people is in this particular situation is you have to be very careful because does it ultimately mean just because Travis has not paid anything into the government that Travis has no money? No, it doesn't. Travis might have ended up paying $30,000, but he saved the rest of it and it's sitting in a bank account somewhere. Okay. So in those situations is there are pros and cons when it comes into these situations. Now, another thing is the appraisal. This is one of the biggest ones. Okay, the appraisal has to meet because it's just like with anything else. When Travis goes out to buy a house, Keith wants to make certain, Travis, that that house that you're buying is actually going to equal what it's going to be used for in collateral. Does, if you're getting a note, Mr. Travis, for say $100,000 and they come back and appraise it for 60, that's not a good collateral for Mr. Keith. Mr. Keith's going to say, hell no, I ain't giving you that, okay? But if it comes back and it's appraised for 120 and you're borrowing 100, he's more than likely to give it to you because he knows he's going to get his cash back. Okay. So in these situations, like I said, is you are going to have your application and your appraisal. The appraisal, of course, helps to verify that this is actually what it's worth. Okay. That it's actually in regards to the content of that property that it's going to actually be worth what I'm borrowing or what I'm lending. Now, the home inspection, okay? The home inspection portion right here, it's not required. That's the thing, it's not required. And that's gonna be a key thing here when we get to another type of loan. So on an FHA, home inspections, not required. It's recommended, but not required. But I'm gonna tell you a little practice tip on the side. If, for example, that say that Miss Leela has a client that goes out and they inspect the property, do you think in any shape or form that Miss Leela should turn that inspection report over to the lender? Do you think that's a wise idea? Hmm? What, what do you say? Hey, no? Travis? No? Why do y'all say no? I say no as well. Why do you say no? It's because of the fact that it could enter, it could cause problems for the client to get the loan approved. That's correct. It could end up in that situation if the lender gets a hold to the inspection report. What ends up happening? <coughs> well, let's think about this. Mr. Keith is the lender. If Mr. Keith sees when there's a home inspection that the roof's bad and there's foundation issues and all that, what's Mr. Keith want one that uh, want Leela to have or have her client do? Have it fixed. What if her client doesn't want to fix it? What if the client only has that five hundred dollars? Kind of up creek without a paddle. You kill a deal. So it's, the client. Go ahead. I'm sorry then the client is going to have to maybe come down on the price of the property or find a lower house or something to purchase. Okay, that's true. But what if the client ends up, cannot end up, I know you said look at another house, but what if the clients can't afford them? Then they're going to have to reevaluate. Correct. They have to come back in and they have to look at these. So there's a lot of things in this situation, guys and gals, that you have to end up when they do home inspections, the, re the best recommendation, if you have a home inspection and you're using an FHA or you're using a conventional loan, do not ever, ever give them the home inspection, ever, okay? I have had lenders before, I've had lenders before that have gone over and had called and be like, hey, uh, Travis, how you doing, man? I'm, we'll say I'm Jake here, okay? Hey man, how's things going? You doing good, bro? Yeah, I'm doing good. Hey man, that's great. So how's that uh how'd that home inspection go? Uh, well, yeah. Got you got your corner already, didn't I? <laughs> uh-huh. See, your thing is is when he calls and he asks you, you just have to say, you know what, I, I haven't got that report back yet. Oh, okay. Well, um, can you send me a copy when you get it? 
I, I have to talk to my client and I'll get back to you. Okay? You got to end up, you got to kind of delay it because a lender truthfully cannot require you to give a home inspection to them. They're going to ask about it, but they can't force you to do it. And when the lenders call me, sometimes they'll say, Aiden calls me, he's a lender, he calls me and says, hey man, what's up, Justin? Doing good, doing good. How you doing, Aiden? No, I'm doing good. So uh, did y'all get that home inspection done? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. All right, well, can you send me a copy? Nope. What? Justin, come on, man. We, nope. But just, nope. You, we can do this all day, Aiden. We, we, back before we do this all day, but my answer's still going to say no. So it's you keep asking a million ways, the answer's still no. Okay? So... The thing is, is that in this industry, you have to be a hammer, okay? Your job is to your client, not to who? To yourself. So you have to look out for their benefit. And sometimes, yeah, it may put you in a situation where you're uncomfortable. I tell you, I, I get in that a lot, especially as being a broker. I, I get in a situation where I'm put in, the, in a corner, but I have to deal with it too, okay? So mortgage insurance. That's another important one. Mortgage insurance is extremely key. They're going to require. Now, this is the difference between PMI, this up here under FHA, if you want to write a note to yourself, PMI is what you see on a conventional note, conventional loan. MIP is what's on an FHA. Now, people always ask me, well, what's the difference? You want to know the difference? PMI? That's private, that's private mortgage insurance. That goes with the conventional loan. MIP, FHA. Okay, an FHA loan, that ends up in that situation. It's going to go to this type of loan. Now, the difference, PMI falls off at what percentage? 20%. When's MIP fall off, Travis? What do you think? Right Say never. No, yeah. It no. never falls off. PMI falls off at 20%. MIP stays with the loan the entirety of the loan. See the difference there, okay? Now, there is what's called a Title I FHA loan, and that's for alterations, repairs, and site improvements, okay? And in some situations can be dealt with in some manufactured homes. But I want to tell you something. I get clients that send me this all the time. They find a, they find a manufactured home online. And they're like, Justin, I found this beautiful home. It's a manufactured home. And I'm like, why? number one, why are you buying a manufactured home? Number two, do you know how difficult it is to get an FHA loan on a manufactured home? It's extremely, extremely difficult. Okay. First off, I remember one of my earlier, dear, uh, earlier deals in my career, okay, client ended up with buying land that had a mobile home on it. Had 28 acres, a lot of land, 28 acres, had a mobile home on it. And I'm like, hmm, that's not bad. 28 acres, mobile home, we had a good deal on it. Lender was like, yeah, yeah, we got this approved, everything's great, blah, 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 we got you an FHA. I was still too young and dumb. I was still a newer agent. And uh, nobody called it. My broker didn't catch it. Uh, none of the assistance that we had, nobody called it. It, uh, I think it was a week before closing, and I get a call from Prosperity Bank that says, why in the hell didn't you tell me that this was a single wide home? Huh? Yeah, this is a single wide home. And because it's a single wide home, we don't, FHA doesn't meet FHA requirements. Since it doesn't meet it, we ain't funding this loan. We're backing out, starting out. Excuse me? We're, we're literally done with everything, appraisers and all. Like we, Yeah, it, it was a mistake. We're, we're out. It's bagged out. So my client, I call my client, and she is just screaming up and down, up and down. I mean, she is furious. And I had to work magic. I had to work magic, guys and gals. I had to work magic to get us a new lender to come in and close us very quickly. Okay. So what happens is, is when you have a client that is a person that wants to buy a mobile home, that your stance here in this situation is, is it needs to end up, you need to explain to them that that's fine, we can try to get you approved, but normally it has to be a double wide mobile home, okay? And the 
the home cannot be Mr. A. If you go buy a double wide, it doesn't mean you go down here to Clayton Homes, buy a home and roll it, put it on some land, and that you call it your home. No, you've actually got to put it down and have it locked down to the ground. It cannot be where it's movable. Okay? Very difficult. I tell most people if they're wanting to buy a manufactured home, you might as well just go to the, the mobile home dealer itself and negotiate there. Okay? Now, now, these are the different types. So right back here, we talked about Title I. Title I loans are dealing with alterations, repairs, and site improvements. Okay? Title II is what's your most commonly used programs. Okay? And the most common is going to be what, Mr. Eaton? What's the most common up here? What's the number? Nope. Nope. Needs glasses, sir? Yeah. 203. 203B. Okay. 203B is going to be your Title II uh, loan that's going to be used for a one to four family. Now you're going to be like, why do I need to know this? Well, when you're filling out your third party financing addendum, you got to know every one of those. Because it'll say FHA, FHA section blah. And you get to fill in those. Okay? Now 99.99% of the time, it's going to be a 203B. Okay? Majority of the time. But you may end up in some situations, your client may be approved for a 203K. And a 203K is basically a rehabilitation loan. Okay? So what happens is, is you get clients, say Mr. Travis, you get a client that calls you and says, hey, Mr. Travis, I found a house out in Waller that I want to buy, and it needs a lot of improvements. So I want to kind of basically buy it, but I need to get the lender to give me some cash so I can also flip, flip it. Well, right now, you've probably been like, oh, I don't know, right? Yeah, Jake help, right? Well, in this situation is, is now you can know that a section 203k is what you would use. You can actually go in, if a house needs to be flipped, like those two clients, uh, I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but the two ladies that we ended up showing, yeah. they were wanting to go in and do some repairs and all, a 203k would have been what they would have used. Because a 203k, now the only difference is, is they were in such a higher tax bracket that they probably were outside of the maximum yeah. of this. Okay. But in some situations, yes, you can use a 203K and it basically allows you the money to purchase the house and then additional funds to flip the house. Okay. And that's a 203K. Now, a 20 or 251 is a one year arm. And what that is, is you're basically paying most of the time interest only. Uh, it's basically utilized for flip. But I'm going to tell you, you need to have an experienced real estate, um, or not real estate, a lender that knows what they're doing if they're going to do a one-year loan arm, okay? Because you can, there can be some major issues there. Again, a lot of times with FHA, they have a lot of these little incentives down here. Yeah, that's what this bottom part talked about, specials. This is kind of like those little discounts, okay, when you buy stuff. So they do have energy-efficient mortgages. Okay, so if your house happens to be or meet the requirements of energy efficiency, guess what? You can get a special, you can get a discount. Okay, they do, the, the lenders do say, Aiden, that your house is outdated and it needs to end up, it needs to be more efficient. You can get an energy efficient mortgage for the sole purpose of improving your home. Okay, so you could go in, you could call the lender and say, hey, I want to do some improvements to my property. And I'm an energy efficient, I'm going to get an energy efficient mortgage, an EEM, and they may say, sure, most certainly, go for it, okay? In those situations, is it allows you to go in here and to do what? To fix your property up so that it's more energy efficient, okay? Also, there is the home equity conversion mortgage, an HECM, and this is that reverse mortgage that we talked about last night, okay? Not something that I recommend to you, okay, because of the fact is, is that this should only be utilized if you are an individual 
that is elder, an elderly individual that is unable to make income or does not have income. There is, of course, like we've talked already, the Good Neighbor Next Door program. If you were law enforcement, an educator, firefighter, or an EMT, you qualify. Okay. And of course, your home ownership vouchers. Y'all will be surprised at this, but there's actually programs that are out there that help individuals that are unable to get their, like say for example, God forbid that Mr. Eugene cannot pay his mortgage next month. There are programs that are out there. If he meets the certain requirements, he could get the government to maybe pay one or two months of his mortgage for him. It's a grant, okay? But I will tell you something, gentlemen and ladies here, this is extremely difficult because of the fact of the matter is, is they try to hold those funds only for those that are extremely needy. So it's not like you can get on the phone today, you know, Aiden and call up and say, man, I need some money, government, give me some money. Okay, they're not gonna do that, okay? They're, they're gonna say, you know, we need to see, I, I had a client that went through it once and she got denied it. She would have been a prime candidate that would have got it, uh, but they denied her. And she had, she was only making minimum wage at that time. It was $7.50 an hour. And uh, so she was making $7.50. She was working part-time. She couldn't get full-time. And she ended up, she had two kids. Like it was just, she was doing it all herself. Okay, bare, bare bones, basically. And so I thought, well, she'd get some help to help pay for her mortgage. Nope, denied it. So very difficult. While we do need to know about these programs, pretty difficult to get. They don't make it easy. Or if you want to get it, there's so many hoops you got to jump through. Good luck. Okay. Now, what are our guidelines? What are our underwriting guidelines? Excuse me. Yes. Do you have to pay the money back if you do qualify for this? No, ma'am. It's a grant. Okay. Just checking. Yes, ma'am. It's a grant. So you don't have to pay that back. Good question. Anybody else have questions? All right, perfect. Now, what about the FHA underwriting guidelines? Well, this is the key thing. Like we talked last night, the maximum loan limits, they're set geographically. So if you live in Texas, it's not gonna be the same as if you live in California. Why is that, Travis? What's the reason? Why would, why would Texas be lower than California? The standard of living is a lot lower than California, and houses over here are a lot cheaper than over there. Okay, so if we were to just set it nationally across the board, okay, the maximum is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, there's a problem. How much house are you gonna go get in California for two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Probably in a box. A, a box. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in that situation, is is it set geographically? Also, like we said earlier, it's only three and a half percent you got to put down. So when I talk to my clients, I always say, you don't, well, I always ask my client off, off the top of my head, how much do you think you got to put down? Well, I got to put down at least 20. No, you don't. You, if you don't qualify for an FHA, three and a half. So every hundred thousand, you put $3,500 down. What? Yeah, you can get a hundred thousand dollars for $3,500. Not bad, right? Okay. Um, their qualifications, their income qualifications is that they use the 31 to 43 uh, ratio. Basically what they're saying is, is in most situations, your income to your debt must end up being around 31 to 31% to 43%, okay, in that situation. Your mortgage insurance premiums, there's that MIP, you wanna put that there, MIP, is an upfront plus annual premium paid monthly, okay? So that's that one. Now, if you want to put a note next to it, this does not go away. It does not go oh And it does not go away. It stays there. They also do allow certain closing costs. They will allow for certain closing costs, and those can be given from different individuals. And the seller contribution, here's the key thing here, the maximum that the seller can give to your buyer is 6% of the total sales price, okay? So for every 100,000, the seller can only contribute $6,000. 
Now, I've had people before that have told me, said, well, Mr. Nobles, there's a problem here. I end up, uh, I end up in this situation, okay? They end up, they say, let's just hypothetically do this. Travis, you're representing me in a transaction. We find out that there's foundation issues. It's gonna cost $50,000 to fix, okay? I'm buying a $100,000 house. Let's have the deal. So the client goes and says, the seller says, well, I will give you $50,000 to fix the foundation. Just put it in seller's contribution. What's the problem here? What's the maximum I can get? 6%. So $6,000. Mm -hmm. What happens to the other $44,000? It's gone. So as a real estate agent, I've had an agent before make this mistake, okay, in regards to the 6%. What ended up happening was, was that in that 6%, uh, they put, it wasn't 50,000, I think it was like 12,000, 13,000, something like that. And they were a little higher than 100. But they were over by like two thousand dollars. Went to close and to sit down, and she was running all the numbers, and she's like, "Wait a minute, where's the, where's the extra two thousand dollars?" Well, ma'am, you went over the six percent limit, so that money just that you don't get credited for it. So guess what had to happen? We either had to change the entire documents, which would have pushed the closing out what three more days, because you got to wait three days, or that selling agent had to do what? chunk up out of their commission $2,000, okay? And I'll tell you, you go with those big brand brokerages, like I always tell people all the time, you go with them, do you think they're gonna be as nice as what I did? I told mine, I said, you know what, Aiden, you made the mistake, you know, there's an oversight on our part. You give a thousand, I'll take a thousand, we both, you know, call it a day. Let's, let's just both eat it, okay? We won't do this again, but let's eat it. Do you think that's gonna happen if you go to a big big mom and pop brokerage? No, they're gonna say, that's out of your part and I'm still taking 3% of the total here or I'm taking my percentage out of the three. So you got, you made no money on the whole deal. See a problem? So in those situations is you wanna be aware of these seller contributions. You need to be aware of this information. And I'm, I wanna make it clear. I'm not bashing the big name brokerages by any means. I'm just saying is, there are certain brokerages in these situations that they set policies and they're in their franchise. So it's not the individual broker that's running that franchise. It's the fact of the matter is, is they have to follow the rules from their bosses. Okay. So it's not the fact that that broker doesn't want to work with you. It's the fact of the matter of what they don't want to end up in this particular situation. They don't want to go over and they don't want to end up basically having to explain to somebody else why they split a thousand dollars with eight in the transaction okay just too much of those situations in a second mortgage a second mortgage also can be allowed but there are restrictions reason being with this is they don't really like to have a second mortgage involved they just want to kind of have it all together themselves of course they do have assumptions like we talked about last night you can't assume an fha but the borrower has to qualify and meet those standards does that make sense? So they have to meet the standards in that situation. Now, we're going to jump over to that 203K talking about a purchase and a rehab. So if you jump back over here, that's this part, this bullet point number two there. Okay, so that's rehabilitation plus the purchase. So in this type of transaction, the rehab has to cost at least $5,000. Okay, so it has to cost at least $5,000 and it can add more to bring to an FHA standard okay so you can in some situations you can't add more to it to bring it up to the standards of an FHA loan now the borrower does pay taxes and insurance for six months okay and the rehab funds are paid in draws all right so you're going to buy the property the borrower has to pay, even if they don't keep it for six months, they have to pay at least six months of taxes and insurance, and their funds are going to be given out just like a construction loan. You take them out on draws, okay? The rehab cost must be approved prior to the loan being granted. So what your client wants to do, they must have those approved by the lender before the lender will release it. 
okay, before the loan's even going to be granted. Now, if you're going to buy an older house, you've got to bring that house up to the energy efficient standards and the structural standards that are required by FHA, okay? So you can't go in, say for example that Mr. Travis, he walks in and he, you know, walks along and he goes over, he's showing Aiden properties and everything. And Aiden's like, man, I want to buy that house. It's a 1960s house. You know, I'm going to go in, I'm going to fix the AC. I'm going to fix the foundation. I'm going to put a new roof on it. I'm going to do all this stuff. And so I'm going to need about probably $250,000, okay? For, for repairs plus the purchase, okay? So he's like, I need to borrow about half a million dollars, okay? You get, you somehow magically get it approved, okay? They give it to you. Now you got $250,000 that you think that you're gonna take and you're gonna go fix up this house, but your goal is I'm only gonna put in 100 and pocket 150, okay? It doesn't work like that. A lot of people think that's how this works. No, you actually have to show them what you're gonna do in the rehab costs. You have to show them what you're gonna do and sometimes they even want bids. They want the proof that you got bids for those jobs and you had to submit them and you have to run all those numbers because the goal in this is not for you to pocket. A lot of people think, you know, they'll say this, Aiden tells you, Travis, he says, well, you know, I'm a construction person. I'm going to, I'm a general contractor. I, I got all this myself. Okay. Well, what's Aiden thinking? I'm going to pay myself labor cost for $150,000. I'm going to only put in a hundred and then what ends up happening? I'm going to sell the house and make a profit off of that plus my $150,000. It doesn't work like that. You cannot, on these situations, be the general contractor on a rehab loan. Okay? If you're caught doing that, you can be in a lot of legal trouble. A lot of legal trouble. Now, if you notice this last bullet, it's not available for investors. It's not available for investors. It is only available for individuals that are wanting to go in and they're wanting to fix up the property. They may want to stay in it for a certain period of time. And they, some people even buy it just hold. They'll buy the property and hold it. Okay. But again, you need to make certain that whoever you're working on, on this situation, the lender is aware and understands these processes. Does that make sense to everybody? You cannot just throw something out here. Now, they also have the FHA arm and refinance. Now, as section 251 is an arm, again, they have the maximum loan amount with the down payment and are the same qualifying standards as your normal 203B, okay? And it's gonna either be a one year or a three year uh, arm. The annual cap means it cannot go up more than 1% per year, but the entire cap of the loan cannot go more than 5%. Okay, we cannot make the cap. So if you're at, say, their initial starting for you, uh, Aiden, in this situation is 2%, the entire loan cannot go up above seven. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so what will happen is, now here's the thing, because there's an annual cap of 1%, what do you think is gonna happen every single year? It's gonna go up every year, 1%. 1%, because we got we can only go up to one, but it's gonna go up, go up, go up until they get to seven percent. Then they're capped, and then they're gonna leave that sucker at seven percent. So do you think they're gonna end up say, well, your first 10 years is you know two percent, and then we're gonna start going up from there? No, they're gonna try to get that thing going up real quick in the beginning. So by year about five, guess what? You're paying seven percent. Okay. The main key thing here, the point that they're trying to shoot for is they want to try to get that money. That's why this is not a good loan to be in for a long-term use, okay? They also have streamlined refinance. Again, these are FHA insured. Their current payment must result in lower payments and there can be no cash taken out. You cannot take cash out in this particular situation. Now, the FHA contributions to real estate finance, okay? Again, one of the key things about FHA contributions is, is it has created and it has set a standard for qualifying borrowers, okay? So most banks no longer, they truthfully get your money. Travis, you have 
$200,000 in your bank account, you want to go lend it out to say Mr. Keith, okay? Do you have to use these standards that I'm talking about tonight? No. What could your standard be? Whatever you want it. You can be up there, hey, Keith, man, hey, good guy, handshake, okay, here's 200000 you promised to pay me back. Thanks. You can do that, okay? But in the situation is, is most banks have adopted these standards. And some banks have adopted these as their minimum standards, not their maximum. So they are even more stricter. So if the FHA may only want three years, this Bank over here, the Bank of Stephan may want seven years, okay? So these are your minimum standards for some banks. But again, it sets the basic standards for qualifying a borrower. How do you qualify? They also have standards for appraising property, okay? In regards to what exactly meets the needs, how do we meet those elements? We also have long-term amortized loans so they have now created it where you can pay long term. I always laugh about this a lot of times. You can go out nowadays and buy a hundred thousand dollar car, a hundred thousand dollar car, but you'll pay that hundred thousand dollar car off in seven years. Okay, that's normally the limit they give seven years. But you go buy a hundred thousand dollar house, and it takes you thirty years to pay it off. Okay, so in those situations, I always tell people. You know, the reason that they want to go long term isn't because of the fact is they want to be nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, Miss Leela, I want you to pay 30 years. I'm being so sweet to you. That's not what it is. It's not that they're being sweet. They want to shoot it out 30 years because of what? What have we been talking about? Interest. The longer that Miss Leela pays me, what happens? The more money I'm breaking in. Okay? That's why I always tell people all the time is. Shorten your notes. Shorten your notes. You shorten your notes, you end up in the situation you pay it off quicker. All right? But banks end up, they sell these long term loans because of the fact is they know if we sell these long term loans, what ends up happening? We're going to make more money off of them. Okay? They also provide foundation for a national market in mortgage securities. Okay? They've actually created this market where we put our stuff into these mortgage securities, okay? Now, that stops right there, your FHA. Now we're jumping into VA. So that, if you were taking any notes or whatever, that is your FHA. That is the very first governmental loan, okay? So in that situation, our next big dog that we're gonna stay in this fight is your VA, okay? Now, the thing about VA, like I said, and this is one of the biggest things that you can market on, is the fact of the matter that a VA loan is what? A VA loan offers only 0% down. That's why I tell veterans all the time, go buy a house. Buy a house. Why? Because you put 0% down. Zero dollars. Okay? Another thing is, is there's a guarantee that's also given by the government. And it has to be 25% of the current conforming limit. And that changes relatively very often, okay? Now, the eligibility and entitlement, all right? To be eligible, number one, we gotta look at your length of service. How long did you serve? Were you somebody that came in for a little bit? Did you serve your term that you agreed to? What was your service? Okay, that's your very first one. The next one we want to make certain of is, are you technically eligible for a VA? Say in this particular situation that Mr. Darren served in the Army, and he served eight years in the Army, okay? Mr. Garrett served eight years in the Army. He goes over, he has that eight years of experience. Mr. Uh, Darren goes over, he has about to get ready to be uh, discharged and he does something stupid and they dishonorably discharge him. Do you think, Mr. Travis, that Mr. Darren will get a certificate of eligibility? Why are you saying no? Because he's dishonorably discharged. What does that mean, Mr. Travis? That he's basically been sent home without Was he, did he fulfill his duties? No. He did not fulfill his duties. Since he did not fulfill his duties, 
even though he served eight years, he's not going to be able to get a certificate of eligibility because he was dishonorably discharged. Okay, your client must be honorably discharged for them to end up getting a VA entitlement. Now, I can tell you for a fact, I have dealt with clients before, dealt with many clients before, where they ended up in a particular situation. They ended up, they went through, and they completed their, their service, and at the very end, they did something stupid, and because they did something stupid, they got dishonorably discharged. So all of that time that they put into it was flushed down the toilet because of a stupid decision. And I've dealt with clients like that. And it's difficult because you put eight years of your life or longer in it and you don't get any of the benefits, okay? Um, there's also, in some situations, you could have partial entitlement, but again, very rarely do you see that happen, okay? In some areas, some areas it happens, but in areas like where we're at, not so often. And it's very key in this situation when you are looking for a vendor, in regards to a lender in this situation, it is imperative that you ask that vendor. This is why you want to have multiple vendors. It is imperative that you ask the vendor or that particular person, that lender, how long and how many of these VA loans have you done? Okay. If I go and I talk to Mr. Grossman and Mr. Grossman tells me, well, yeah, I'm certified VA, but I've never done one. Do you think it's a wise idea for me to have Mr. Grossman as my lender? No, he may have a ton of FHA. He may have done thousands of FHAs, but if he has no experience with VA or he tells me or he makes a comment, that, yeah, I really don't like VA loans, that should be a trigger to me to say, I'll use him for residential, but I am not using him for VA, okay? Until he gets some more under his belt. It's just like in real estate. You don't want to end up in a situation that a multi-million dollar sale Say a commercial person comes into you, Travis, today and says, yeah, I want to buy the largest skyscraper in Houston. Okay? You would love that. Yeah. But they're going to ask you, how many years experience you have in selling commercial real estate? Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> and that situation is they're going to want to see it. And if they don't see it, they're not going to use you. Okay? So it's imperative by all means that your clients are aware and that you as real estate agents bring in people that are experienced with VA. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I remember a, one of my, way back when I used to have, I was a team lead. I remember one of the agents on my group. She had got a guy, basically matched her client with this guy that supposedly was an expert in VAs. Okay. Went over. <laughs> she, she was here. She, she hurt me. She went over, the, the lender went over and approved it for $300,000, okay? They got through half the process before she found out that this lender, quote unquote, never pulled the certificate of eligibility. He ran it off of this guy's word and went on and ran the, ran the whole thing. And when they went to order the CRV, which we're about to talk about, the appraiser called the lender and said, hey, do you have a copy of the certificate of eligibility? And the guy started going through the files, couldn't find it. He's like, I swore I did it, I swore I did it. He called over to the Veterans Administration and the Veterans Administration said they had no recollection of him and the person that he was doing had been dishonorably discharged, which made the entire process went to crap really quick, okay? So in that situation is, it is imperative, it is imperative that you get a certificate of eligibility. If you do not have a certificate of eligibility, guess what? That loan's dead. Now, real estate agents, is it our requirement to get a certificate of eligibility? No. We don't have to get that. We don't. It's not our problem. But do you think it's wise that you probably check in and make sure the lender has got it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes if my client has a copy of it, I'll ask them to send me a copy. And when I get it, I'll CC it to the lender and put it in my file. Okay. Because the fact is, 
He said, if something happens, I got it. Okay, I can't tell you how many times. This is what I tell people all the time. Lenders, if, if Stefan, if you are a lender, how many transactions do you think you're working on a day? Uh, probably 10. 10 at the least. Sometimes you're working on 50 at one time in a day. And let's think about this. If you're working on 50 different transactions in a day, okay, we've already designated that around holding a real estate agent, five is about the norm that one person can do. Imagine if you're doing 50, okay? And you got assistants that are helping you. Which one do you think Stefan's time is going to be on? Travis's $5 million house or Aiden's $50,000 VA loan? Why is he focusing on him? Aiden. More money. More money. So what happens in this situation? Do you think? Huh? <laughs> so in that situation is they're going to go after the more money. He's going to focus on that client. And sure enough, there's going to be things that are going to fall through the cracks, and yours is going to be one of them. Okay? So in that situation, it's imperative that you understand that you must get that certificate of eligibility. Because if they are not eligible, guess what? Ain't worth your time. Okay? Another thing is the certificate of resale value. This is going to be the difference in regards when I talk about certificate of resale value. This is actually your appraisal. That's what this is. So we don't call it an appraisal in real estate or in, in VA terms. You're going to call it a certificate of reasonable value. Now, do you think that an appra any appraiser can be a do a certificate of, uh, of value, certificate of reasonable value? No, they have to have training. They have to have certain training. So in this particular situation is when we're dealing with certificate of resale, uh, reasonable value, we have to make certain that that individual is ending up that they are actually going to be able to give a reasonable value of that property. So it's an appraisal, an appraiser that's going to give you basically the same thing as an appraisal, but it's going to be called a certificate of reasonable value. Okay. So very important in that situation. Now I will also tell you in regards to VA loans, they do require what's called a wood destroying uh, insect report. Okay. And here's the best thing. Here's the best thing. Mr. Aiden, I got a question for you. Sure. Do you think, or who would you think does the home inspections for a VA loan? Who's the one that does the home inspection? Yeah, that guy. Who is this? That's to get a reasonable value. Who is he though? What's his name? What do we call him? Starts with an A. I said it a couple of times. There you go. The, the appraiser is going to be the one that's going to do the certificate of reasonable value, but they're also going to do the, v, uh, the WDI, that's what we call it, Wood Destroy Insects Report. So they're the one that's going to go around the house, not only appraise the property, but they're also going to go around and look for rot. Now here's the best part. <clears throat> they're going to end up, any report that's done for a WDI, if they find any wood destroying ant, uh, insect issues, guess what? That person has to come back out and redo their report again. So you have to send them out twice. So I always tell my people all the time with a VA loan, you're going to have to, if you're a buyer, you're going to have to pay for two inspections. The initial WDI and the secondary WDI. Okay, because every house always has WDI issues, period. Okay. Now, another thing that you need to be aware of, is that when you're dealing with this appraiser, this appraiser also in, in a situation is going to look at your contract. Now we talked about earlier the seller's concessions. Okay, remember we talked about seller's concessions. Now understand with seller's concessions in these situations, what happens in these uh, these, these particular situations with seller's disclosure or seller concessions is that in previously you have six percent in a FHA. In this one, say Mr. Jacob is selling his house to you, A. Okay? You're a VA, a veteran. Mr. Jacob is not a veteran. And he's selling his house to you. Okay? Now, Mr. Jacob, when he purchases your house, okay, when he comes in and he purchases your house, what happens in this, or scratch that way off here. 
when Mr. Jacob selling his house to you and you're purchasing the house for Mr. Jacob, Mr. Jacob has to give you a percentage of closing costs. So here's what happens. And that's all the power. It's not just in this hypothetical. If it is a VA loan, it is a VA loan. If Mr. Jacob is selling for say 200,000, he is required normally to give 5% to a veteran for closing costs. Okay. So he has to, in that situation, he's got to give you $10,000 for closing costs on this loan. So he's got to credit you $10,000, but he wants to make $200,000. So what happens here? You think Mr. Jacob, number one, would sell to you for $190,000 when he knows he can get $200,000 for that house? No. Okay. So what happens is real estate agents do this a lot. We're going to just bump the thing up to $210,000, put 10 in concessions, and you're going to buy the house for $210,000. Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is this appraiser comes out to do a certificate of reasonable value, and guess what they find out? It's only worth $200,000. It's only worth $200,000. So in that particular situation, Mr. Jacob has no option but to do what? Drop his price or terminate the contract. You see how there's a problem. So Mr. Jacob in that situation, at this point, by the time he gets the appraisal, how, when does the appraisal come in? At the very beginning or at the very end? Very, very, very end. So by now, Mr. Jacob has already probably moved out of his house. He's ready to close and he finds out that he only has 200 and there's ten thousand dollars that he's about to lose okay so now in this situation mr jacob is what forced to do what gotta just accept it because he's not going to be able to put it back on the market and wait whoever knows how long yeah. so now he's up a creek without a path do you see why as a real estate agent do you see why va loans can be not something that many people like okay because of the fact of the matter is, is that most people, once they've been screwed once by a VA loan, they will never be screwed again. And they will do what to all their friends? What are they going to tell all their friends? Don't, you. Don't you touch those. Stay away from them. And that's one thing I tell my clients all the time is, you see, here's the thing. In a VA loan, like, well, let's just, let me back up for a second. How long, Travis, does it normally take to close on a normal deal? How many days? 30 days. 30 days. Okay. How long do you think it is for a VA loan? 60 to, 60 to 90 days. So imagine if Mr. Jacob set on this transaction 60 days, even 90 days, and then finds out that it comes in at $200,000. At that point, he's pretty much, he might have already put himself out of the peak season. So now he's in dead season. He has no option. He's kind of got his hands tied. He has no option but to do what? Just take it and move on. And take a loss. But who's he going to chew out? His real estate agent. He's going to destroy his real estate agent. Why don't you tell me this? Blah, 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 blah. But do they teach you the stuff in real estate school? No, I do, thankfully. But in reality, most of them don't. Question? <laughs> yes, Miss Linda. Why not? Miss Linda, do you have a question? No, I'm sorry. Holly was just barking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. All right. So in that particular situation, like I said, with VA loans, please understand that when we're dealing with these VA loans, you've got to be aware of these different issues because each and every one of these are going to be things that you need to be alert on. Okay. It is very key that when you talk to your client, if you get a VA offer, when I get a VA offer, my very first thing is, and I think Travis, you got a VA offer on one. And I think I told you, be very careful with it. Be very careful because those VA loans can come back and they can bite you and then you know what? This is the reason why, okay? You make a mistake, it can end up, it can be a big issue, big issue. Trust me on that, okay? You can click on the slide. Okay. Now, in regards to getting uh, qualified, now you notice here, look at this 41%, but let's go back here for a second. Look here at this one. 
See the difference in regards to income qualifications? You have 3143. And then over here in this one, what do you have? You've got what? 41. So in some situations, a VA might not always be your best interest, especially if you have a lot of debt. Okay. I've had people before. They got approved for a VA and an FHA, but they ended up in the situation is they went with the FHA because of the fact was they had a higher chance of success. Okay. They ended up had a higher success of getting more funds because their debt was too high. Okay. So it's very key in this situation that you're aware of these different uh, breakdowns. But again, it's 41% of the gross monthly income. They're also in this situation, there will be some type of income that's going to be required. Okay, there's a certain amount of residual income that has to be required. Again, those limits change. Do you need to know the details of it? No, that's not your job. That's the, that's the lender. There are also certain types of compensating factors that come into this. And on average, the closing cost in most of these situations, they all may be paid by the seller plus 4%. So the seller can give this individual, the, the, the seller can give the buyer, pay for all closing costs and still give 4%. Do you see how much more money? So if you're ending up, if a person needs a lot of money down, they're both approved for FHA and VA, but there needs a lot of seller concessions, this may be your best loan. Now, is it your duty, though, in this situation to know all of these things? No, it's not your job. Okay. <clears throat> there is a funding fee. Again, they're higher for certain reservation, reservationist and subsequent use. Again, in this situation, in regards to VA loan miscellaneous matters, there is a second mortgage that is, again, going to be allowed. But again, we're going to look at certain restrictions. There can be buy downs as well. Okay, certain buy downs in these situations where you can come in and buy down certain points, right? And there can also be the assumption where the lender can approve it. This loan, just like FHA, can be assumable. Now, of course, you can have a release of liability and novation with this one, unlike the previous. And the reason that an FHA cannot be a, li a release of liability is because an FHA loan, guess what? You can have more than one. You can have more. With this one, in a VA, you can only have one. Okay? So in this particular situation, is if they're going to sell their house, they need to re be released of liability, have a novation where they get rid of the transaction so they can get a new loan. Because a veteran can only have one VA loan at a time. So that means that if, Aiden, you go out and you go get approved, okay, and you buy a house, and then you want to buy Travis's house, you have to already have somebody lined up to buy yours so you can buy his. Does that make sense? Okay. There's also a substitute of entitlement. And again, this allows veterans to reuse their entitlement. This is where you can move, like we just talked about, you can move forward. They also do have arms, and they're going to be at one-fifth caps. Okay, which means 1% every five years. Okay, and again, they also do have streamlined financing and uh, refinancing as well. Okay, so as you can see, VA and FHA are huge parts when it comes into basically the everyday operations of your business. Okay, so it is imperative that you understand these different types of loans. But again, I want to keep emphasizing this. You do not need to know all of the details. You don't need to know. That's not your job. You go in and you find yourself, like always, my old broker used to always tell me, he liked to have five lenders, five lenders, and he would go eat with them at least every other month. He'd go have lunch with them. And I said, why do you do that? He said, because programs are constantly changing every single day. There's always changes. There's always a new program. There's always more money or something. So as a real estate agent, it is imperative that you're getting out there talking to people, that you're calling around. A lot of people, they're like, well, I don't want to call a lender. That's just awkward. I'm meeting with somebody I don't know. Well, let me tell you something. If you find a lender that's going to save your tail and make a deal happen, it's going to work for you. Okay. Travis, I think, have you talked to Jake too? Mm -hmm. okay. 
Did does Jake bite when you call him? Like does he bite? No. Not, not that much. Okay. Mr. Grossman, does he bite? Not me. Not yet. Not you. <laughs> In that situation, is most of these lenders are just like you. And let me tell you, I get a lot of leads off the of lenders because the fact is they get them pre-approved. What other person would you want? What other kind of lead would you want when they call you and say, hey, I got a pre-approved person for $400,000. You want them? Uh, yeah, I'll take that over a buying lead. Any, the one I got to go buy any day. Okay. So again, it is imperative by all means that your clients are aware of these situations, that you're aware of them. So if you want to be able to set yourself apart from everybody else, to do that, you want to end up, you want to go this method. Okay. All right. So here's what's going to happen. We are technically done this evening with this slide. I know a lot of you are probably like, heck yeah. Uh, we have finished up. Uh, you know, the last two classes have been very long, but I am going to put up a, a supplemental video because I do like to add the videos in there to help supplement some of the material. Uh, again, y'all need to make certain that you are completing your assignments, that you are completing your quizzes and all, uh, and making certain you're staying on top of it. But we will put a, a supplemental video up in regards to the discussions of these types of loans. And then, of course, we will pick up tomorrow, which is Thursday, I believe. So we have two more days and we are finished with this class. So officially as of Friday, guess what, y'all? Those of you that have been with me since day one, you're done. Forever. You're finished. You have done uh, your half of your, your, your program. You're done. You're halfway through it. You're almost done to finish up the rest. So we only have, after Friday, two classes really left. You have finding, or you have agencies and principals, and that's it. Okay? So we're on track. We're moving in the right direction. Y'all all keep going and keep doing what you're doing, and we will pick back up tomorrow. So y'all all have a good evening, and I will see each and every one of you uh, tomorrow. So have a good night.